Hello, and thanks for taking time to rise up. I'm Don Ennis. This is a very frightening time for people like me, and not for the first time. It's a repeat of the darkest chapters in American history. The United States government is moving to permit discrimination. People of color, Irish Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Jewish Americans, Latino Americans, and immigrants to our country have all experienced this hatred over the centuries. So have gay and lesbian Americans. And in recent weeks, it's become clear transgender Americans are the latest target of the Trump administration. We're joined now by a West Hartford woman who knows plenty about political activism. Claire Kindle is a lawyer with more than 28 years experience in law and order, both in private practice as well as in town and state government. She served five years on West Hartford's Board of Education, including two as chair and two terms on the town council. After eight years in private practice, Claire joined the Connecticut Attorney General's office in 1998, and she's been head of the Attorney General's Energy Department since 2011, where she's helped recover more than $100 million from public utilities that have been used to rate, reduce rates for consumers. And now she's running for State Attorney General. Welcome, Claire. I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Now, I want to talk to you about the subject we just talked about on the video. What can Connecticut do to stop the blatant discrimination against American citizens that just happen to be transgender? Connecticut has robust anti-discrimination laws. And as Attorney General, I would vigorously enforce those. We need also to ensure that our state laws are not preempted by federal law. So that if the federal government, which it's been doing on every level of our government, steps back from some pretty foundational principles of our country, at least our state is standing strong on those principles. Now I want to give the viewers full disclosure. I'm a member of the uh, Town Democratic Committee, I'm a Democrat. And uh, although I'm disclosing this, I am not um, uh, going to uh, make anyone think that I am here endorsing Claire, but I've actually invited the other candidates who are running for office uh, to come on the show and have equal time. But uh, I was uh, one of the people who did endorse your uh, nomination, or sorry to say, is it your nomination? What, what's, what's the right and word? And voted, voted to endorse my candidacy. Your candidacy. That's right. For the town committee. So I was very proud to do that. And I, I think what's necessary, uh, what's obvious when you go visit the state capitol, is how few women there are. What's it like being a woman in government in this Me Too era? There isn't a woman of my generation who doesn't have a Me Too moment. And it's so commonplace, and we don't talk about it, but I do not know a professional woman of my, of my age who has not had a Me Too moment. I can't begin to tell you the number of times I have been in 20 th 2018 in a conference room, and I am the only woman in the room. And then you have other circumstances where you're in the room, and it's half women and half men, and it feels just so natural and so correct. Uh, I find with the Attorney General's role, if elected, I would be the first woman elected as Attorney General. We have had a woman elected to every other statewide office, but not to the Attorney General's office. Uh, the gov we've had a woman governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, comptroller, treasurer, but never an attorney general. We had a woman who served as attorney general for two years. I was going to ask you, year. there was a woman who did serve yeah, before you. Yeah, in Nardi Riddle. She was excellent, very highly regarded. But she was appointed to fill out the remainder of Joe Lieberman's term with the express... He was running for vice president. Be, no, at the time he was, had just been elected senator. Oh, okay, well, even further back then. Yes, much further back. Um, but she was appointed with the express understanding that she not run. So if elected, I would be the first woman elected. That's quite a statement. There are also, of the 50 states, every state has their own attorney general, only nine are women. Hmm. Out of 50. Out of 50. Now, let's explain what this job is, because I think people hear attorney general, and if they are following the news, they know it's Jeff Sessions as far as the federal government. Are you running to be Jeff Sessions of Connecticut? <laughs> I'm running to be Claire Kindle of Connecticut. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 
I have, I have trouble even <laughs> forming those words in my mouth. But tell us, tell us what the Attorney General does, and you've served in that office for quite some time, so you should have some familiarity. I uh, just a smidge. I was hired by Richard Blumenthal, who was uh, Attorney General for 24 years. And I also was George Jepson, who's the current Attorney General. I've worked with him for the past seven years. I was also his statewide campaign manager. The Attorney General's office is the chief civil litigator lawyer for the, for the state of Connecticut. We do not have any criminal jurisdiction, or as so minute as to not matter. The, chi the chief state's attorney's office has criminal jurisdiction in Connecticut. So you don't fight laws. You're not the lawman or law person. We are the law people, but we do not do criminal prosecutions. Got it. And criminal law and civil law really are two very different things. Criminal, there's a rhythm to criminal law. I would not be competent to defend somebody in criminal court. I hope and I have to find people, that. <laughs> but but also folks who are, you know, in criminal law really don't know much about what we do on the other side. My, the analogy I use is you don't have you go to your eye doctor to do a hip replacement. <laughs> very smart. Your eye doctor is very smart. Both the surgeon and the eye doctor went to medical school. Right. Eye doctor will learn it eventually, but it's not what they do for a living. Got so it. if you want your hip replaced, do you go to your eye doctor or do you go to, to go to your surgeon who's done it all for, for that time? And you're also... I've 20 years in the office. And you're also not the governor's lawyer either. Correct. No, the governor has his, has his or her own lawyer. Uh, I uh, am the people's lawyer. I uh, represent the people of the state of Connecticut and the state's interests in all matters uh, of civil litigation. So let's uh, hear one of these stories you told us. Was it during your time in the AG's office that you had a Me Too moment, or was it before then? Oh, it was before then. Me Too moments are about power, not sex. That's right. Just like rape. <laughs> yes. And so it was uh, with when I was a paralegal. Wow. I, you know, grew up in Waterbury and did not have... Uh, uh, never knew, met a lawyer. Went, went to college, graduated from college, and never met a lawyer. But my mother said, Claire, you need to be a lawyer. You do nothing but argue. <laughs> 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 and so, wow. <laughs> and so, after graduating from Wellesley, um, and I had spent my junior year at the London School of Economics, I came back home to Waterbury and looked around Waterbury law firms to say, well, you know, can I figure out how to, what lawyers do? And they said, well, you need to go get your paralegal degree. And I said, if I'm going to go get my paralegal degree, I'm going to go get my law degree. Why, do, why would I do that? So I sent my resume around Washington, D.C., and received a couple of job offers, moved down to D.C., and worked as a paralegal for three years. And while there, I said, okay, I now know what a lawyer does. <laughs> I think I'm good at it. It does involve arguing, but it involves other things and moved across south of the Potomac and was in state for University of Virginia. Wow. And went to the University of Virginia School of Law, graduated, came back, practiced law for four years in a very large DC law firm, and then came back to Hartford, uh, to a large uh, Hartford law firm, Shipman and Goodwin. And then you know, went off to the AG's office in 1998, Amazing. and somebody handed me my life back <laughs> gift wrapped. It was wonderful. Now, we both lived in Virginia. I lived in Arlington for some time when I worked at Politico during the 2008 political campaign, ah. which was quite interesting. But I'd like to compare what was life like in Virginia compared to Waterbury. And I, I understand also uh, you grew up in Waterbury in a very uh, public service-oriented family. Well, I grew up in Waterbury, and Waterbury is a great town. Um, everybody knows each other. It's a very small town for all. It's a big, a big city. But my brothers are Waterbury firefighters, and my sister's a special ed teacher, and obviously I have been um, an assistant attorney general for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we're all public servants. We're all union members. Uh, my, si my mother is one of seven, of which five still live in Waterbury. I'm one of 16 first cousins, of which 12 live in Waterbury, wow. which is why I lived in West Hartford, so I could stay married. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people there. Yeah, that's, that distance makes the heart grow fonder. Well, my great aunts <laughs> were, were so worried. I mean, they were very adorable. Yeah. But they were like, you went all the way home to West Hartford. Do you need to stay the night driving all the way from Waterbury to West Hartford? Why would you do that? In, in their generation, <laughs> it seemed like forever, right? Exactly, sure. exactly. Sure. And, and I would think that... Um, growing up in the Brass City, 
gives you a different indication of West Hartford in terms of, you know, we're a very progressive town. We're very um, invested in our um, people, but there isn't really an industry or even a failing industry like it happened in Waterbury. Waterbury was such a tremendous engine for development in Connecticut's history. Um, what can the Attorney General do in terms of business? Because I think a lot of people worry about their taxes, they worry about how much money they're spending, how much money the government takes from them, and for me especially, who's protecting my rights? What does the Attorney General do in those regards? You asked 16 questions in that. <laughs> <laughs> this is part one of our 16-part show. Sorry about that. And um, that's quite all right. Um, You're very talented. You can handle <laughs> I it. I figure we'll, we'll, we can make it through. The uh, Attorney General, well, for one thing, Carville has it right. It's about the economy, stupid. It's all about the economy. People want to know that they're going to have economic security. The Attorney General can do quite a bit for that. For example, something as simple as net neutrality. Net neutrality is an economic issue because small startup businesses that are internet-based are at risk of being preyed upon and cut out by if a telecommunication company does not need to give them equal access to the internet. So in order to grow businesses and to grow the next wave of businesses, particularly since all of our future businesses are likely to be internet-based, having open access to the internet is critical. The Attorney General has currently has signed on to a federal lawsuit to sue, to take an appeal from the Federal Communications uh, Commission. mm -hmm. Commission's uh, Appear, you know, really very wrong-headed decision yeah. on mm. that issue. It's a very conservative-run administration right now, so they are doing things to, in their eyes, um, foster business and remove regulation. I don't know that's really fostering business. I think monopoly has always been a problem, and monop the, the ability to use monopoly power to crush out any opposition has always been a problem. And you fear that if net neutrality uh, is not preserved, that um, my internet speed might not be as fast or as accessible to the o open free internet as someone who pays more or is uh, a more favored client of a provider. Is that right? Correct. But also, there's nothing to stop the internet companies from closing it down for content. Wow. So we are already in an era where the tax code is being used as a weapon to punish your political opponents. I mean, the elimination of the state and local income tax is the first time, I think, in our history where the tax code has been used to punish blue states and to benefit red states. What is to stop a telecommunication company from saying, if you are left-leaning, you get slow speeds. If you are right-leaning, you get high speeds or reverse it. I don't care. If you are left-leaning, you get the fast internet, and if you are right-leaning, you get the slow internet. That, that way lies tyranny. Mm. That if you are allowing the, you know, I mean, I th let's face it, Fox is almost a propaganda. Um, almost? Instrument. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm being polite. Almost. I'm running for office. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> and, and, and you want all the votes. I, don't, I understand that. But let's just go shift over to another uh, aspect of money, because I mentioned earlier in my introduction that um, you've helped people get money back in their accounts from public utilities. How did that work out? The Office of the Attorney General represents both the Public Utility Regulatory Authority, which is the state agency that regulates utilities, uh, electricity, water, telecommunication. Um, it affects every uh, natural gas, it affects every household in the state. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission ha imposes a fair number of costs on Connecticut utility payers. Um, to pay for transmission lines, to pay for uh, a regional um, ISO New England. And we were able to, before the federal government, get those rates reduced. And when you're speaking of every person in Connecticut, every household in Connecticut, even a small reduction in, in those costs has a major impact for Connecticut ratepayers. So we were able to, in some cases, the money was taken and reduced what, an, it, re, it eliminated an increase that would have happened, and others, it reduced the rates of, that happened for people's utilities bills. Hmm. Now, as far as politics goes, when you run this fall on the ballot, your name will not be alone. There'll be other people running for office, including someone running to replace Dan Malloy. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's correct. How does that work in terms of 
you having to hew their, your um, beliefs and your policies and your, your um, politics toward other candidates. Are you aligned with anyone right now? Or is there someone that you'll have to align yourself with? How does that work? Because it, it seems like a trade bargain that you have to basically, well, I'll give you this if you keep this. There will be no bargains, and there don't need to be. Um, in many ways, there's really a great time to be in politics. I have, was elected four times in West Hartford, and I am incredibly grateful to the town of West Hartford for it. But there was a sense of running that, okay, yes, things are fine, people are running, this is nice. No one's asleep right now. No one is complacent. Going around the, the, all over the state, people are engaged, they're excited, they're angry, they're worried, but they're there. And we have a wide variety of candidates for attorney general. Some of them who are outside the government. Uh, correct, and a wide variety of candidates for treasurer. We even have three candidates for secretary of state, and I think we have six or eight or nine candidates for governor. At this point, we're all in the pool. <laughs> well, actually, and double that because you have the Republicans running for office correct. as well. And oof. Well, and then that's just on the Democratic side. Yes, of course. And so both the Democrats and the Republicans were going to go to convention. And there will be a primary in August. And we need people to go and vote in August when you're rather be at the beach. And from that process, the voters will speak about who they want on their ballot. So it's not as though I can say, listen, you know, to a gubernatorial candidate, if you support me, I'll support you and we'll be on the ballot. No, the voters are going to decide that. And so there will be at least three and probably four AG candidates on the ballot. There will be at least three and probably four treasurer candidates. There will be at least four and maybe six gubernatorial candidates. That, the voters will decide how they're going to pick, who they're going to do. Now, there's certain common, by being a Democrat or being a Republican, there are common planks of a platform that, you know, we support and our values. But it is a, um, I think it will be an easy, uh, it will be, it, it's going to be a fun time. It's a fun time to be in politics. It's a fun time to be stepping forward. But we don't have to worry about my colleagues. I just need to worry about the voters. But I am worried because I look at the field of candidates and I see, let's see, there's a woman, there's a woman, not a lot of women. Not a lot of women. Is this because, w you tell me, why don't we have equal representation as women in our government? Women and men are different. <gasps> <laughs> this <Newsflash. laughs> <laughs> You heard it here f first, folks. No, I, I'm aware, I think most people are, but is it pervasive sexism? Is it that um, we're supposed to be at home taking care of kiddos? Or is it more that people just don't see women as equals? And I see people, I mean women and men, because 51% of white women in America voted for Donald Trump. And I, I can't put this all on the men. I, I, I imagine there's something in a group think that says, well, I don't know if I should vote for a woman. I, I wonder how that makes you feel. I think it's a little I think it's not so much the vote as much as the stepping forward. Now, clearly, we have the, you know, the extreme stereotypes of women. Yes. You know, sort of like, oh, she's nice, she's mean, you know. And Stormy Daniels in between. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> women, we don't step forward, typically, unless we're invited. Am I, you, you speak to a lot, you speak to many women politicians, and you'll find somewhere at the beginning, somebody said, will you do this? Mm -hmm. That invitation was made. And right or wrong, men aren't so necessarily needing an invitation from somebody else to step forward. There's a little bit more of a, well, I'll just do this. And good for them, because I think as women, we need to do that more. There's Absolutely. a lot of great programs going on right now that are being done to encourage women to run, such as Emerge CT, mm -hmm. and where they train women on how they can run and what the rules of the game are. And those are the kinds of programs we need so that people can say, yes, I can run. Well, tell us how you rose up. That's what our show is about, is about political activism, about not sitting at home and yelling at the internet or the TV, but doing something. How did you do it, and what do you recommend people do so they can be like you, be like Claire? Oh, man. <laughs> I, don't to agree. I don't know if we want to wish that on them. Um, Thank you. The, what I would say is I was invited. Within, you know, I ran George Jepson's statewide campaign. 
I received a call from him saying I'm not going to run for re-election. Fifteen minutes later, a friend of mine called and said, so are you running? <laughs> Fifteen minutes. <laughs> and I said, I hadn't thought about it. I said, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? I am the most experienced candidate out there with political experience and the time, temperament, judgment, and leadership ability to do it. But women, we need that kind of assurances that yes, we have checked all the boxes and therefore, you know, you just trust yourself and go forward. And you also have to fundraise, which is the dark side of politics in America today, not just Connecticut. Is that a challenge for you? The clean election system for the state is a marvelous thing, and without it, I could not run. So with, with that is, makes all the difference in the world. It turns fundraising on its head. Rather than having a few people write very large checks, you have a wide variety of people write a relatively modest amount. So www.clairekindle.com. We'll have it right here on the screen. <laughs> it's right here. And we'll also link to it on my website, myvaffordawn.com. Um, because I need about 1,000 people to write me checks of $100 or less, or do donate online. And the state pays the rest of the money, and we never have to talk about money again. It, makes, it is a wonderful thing for democracy. Why the hell isn't this happening nationwide? Why is this limited to Connecticut? Is it? Is it's a state program. It, it sounds like it's logical, which I guess is why it's not happening across America. Um, <laughs> as we close, I, I'd really like to know, what message do you have for the voters about why vote for you? I mean, it all comes down to this. They'll be alone, they'll see a bunch of names, and they'll see yours. What do you want them to think when they see Claire Kendall on the ballot? That I am the most experienced candidate. I know the job. I've been doing it for 20 years. I have the endorsement of over 50 of my colleagues in the office. They know that I have the temperament, the leadership ability, and the judgment to be your next Attorney General. And in many ways, I am the anti-Trump. I am a progressive, pro-choice, professional woman running for the job in which I am an expert at. And if you entrust me as your next Attorney General, I will always defend you and your family. Could you support a Republican governor? As I was, a, remember, I was hired under Richard Blumenthal, who always was with a Republican That's governor. That's true, Governor Rowland, right. Governor Rowland. Well, exactly. Uh, so I, the job is to defend the people of Connecticut and the laws of the state of Connecticut. And the governor would be as bound by those laws as I would be. So, uh, yes, absolutely. It's one of the things I actually love about West Hartford. I have neighbors that are like the model UN. I have Asian, uh, Orthodox Jewish, Irish, like us, um, uh, uh, people of all walks of life. And believe it or not, there were Trump flags and signs on some of our neighbors' uh, lawns because there are Republicans here. It's not all blue. Correct. Um, I've never known a time where people are so divisive. Is there something that you can look into your crystal ball and say, here's how we fix that? Uh, well, I'd be running for some, I think I'd be running for Pope, not AG. <laughs> <laughs> yes, God bless. <laughs> but that said, um, I would say that what the election in November 2016 revealed is that there is a great schism in our country between people who feel they have been part of the American dream and people who feel the American dream has been snatched from them. I think we need to address that hurt and that division in order to unify. We are all Americans, and we have a great country, and we need, we're a country of laws, not of personality TV shows. <laughs> we need to, to ensure <laughs> that the foundations of our democracy stay strong and that we pull together as Americans because it's a pretty beautiful thing. Fantastic. Great meeting you, Claire. Thank you very much. I look Lauren. forward to seeing you along the campaign trail. Indeed. And I want to introduce you and all of our viewers now to someone else who's rising up. It's our special correspondent. And each month we have someone tell us a little bit about themselves and how they are rising up. This month we're meeting a friend of mine. She's a native New Yorker. She lives on Long Island. And she's studying for her degree in social work. And what she is as a daughter of Holocaust uh, victims. She is someone who uses that pain and that experience to help others. And I really am very proud to introduce Gabrielle to you. Hi, Dawn. 
I'm Gabrielle Spear, Dawn's special correspondent for Rise Up with Dawn this month. Today, I want to talk to you about the definition of bravery and also about building bridges through diversity. I think it's really important to expand the definition of bravery. Typically, we look at people that are brave, you know, as firefighters, police officers, people in the military, people that take action in dangerous situations and uh, uh, EMTs and many other types of situations such as that. I think that people who are their authentic self and open in, out in the world are very brave people. Being yourself in a world that's having a hard time with that is really being a very brave person. People, especially people that come out at work and live their authentic life should also be a group of people that should see as being brave. In a perfect world, we should be able to leave our politics, our personal views, our family values, and our political views, as well as our sexual orientation, our gender identity, all at the door when we go to work. People that are transgender and have had their jobs for a long time and want to keep their jobs and be their authentic self at work are also people that can't leave the, that their identities at the door when they come to work if they want to live openly as their authentic self. So I honestly think that people that come out at work and put everything on the line and potentially lose their jobs, uh, uh, their way to make income, and uh, which will actually put stress on family situations and their personal lives, those are people who are actually also really brave. If employers are getting uh, better employees, they're now not hiding part of themselves, they are um, able to give their full attention to the jobs that they're doing, they uh, are also don't lose any of the experiences they have. So in the case of a male to female uh, transgender employee, the life experiences that they have will be able to be brought with them into their new role. We can use those experiences, because we did have privilege in the past, to be able to raise the glass ceiling and help people in, in the corporate world. To me, people who are living their authentic life in every part of their life and, and being uh, open even at their place of work are really brave people. And I think it would really be wonderful if the world started to see people uh, that way. So thank you, Dawn, for giving this opportunity to me to be your special correspondent. And back to you, Dawn. Thanks. And if you'd like to contribute a special correspondent report, get details here at lifeafterdawn.com. Like, share, and subscribe us on YouTube, and you'll also find all the information you might want to find out about today's guests, about today's topics, at our website. I'm Dawn Ennis. Thanks for joining us, and please remember, come on, rise up.